All right, today we're sitting down with Lamar Bontrager, who is the uh, WOLF General Manager. WOLF stands for Wolcottville Organic Livestock Feed. It's in Wolcottville, Indiana. And uh, um, we're sitting down with him because we just want to learn a little bit about the history and uh, where it's at right now, short history, and a lot of changes over the, way, over the um, short period that uh, it's been in business, but uh, a lot going on. So, Lamar, thanks for sitting down with us, and uh, why don't you give a little introduction of yourself and then go into the background of the co-op. Well, as was mentioned, I'm Lamar Bontrigger. Um, I grew up on a uh, dairy farm, dairy slash hog farm. Um, organically raised by default or however you want to call it, I guess. Uh, not because there was a, a market for it at that time, but uh, my father always felt that it was a sustainable way of farming, and so in my mind he was old school at the time, but uh, I've had to look back and thank him for what I've learned because it definitely has been a huge part of who I am today. Um, and uh, I worked at a, at a feed mill as a teenager <clears throat> and enjoyed it. And uh, not in my wildest dreams did I ever dream I'd own a feed mill or be where I'm at today. So that's a, in a nutshell, I guess, who I am and where I come from. And today you are the general manager of Wolf, which is a cooperative uh, feed mill here in Indiana. Um, why don't you go over the background of the four years since it's, well, go back to when you owned it and then okay. um, turning it into a co-op. Yeah, well, I was, like I said, I was started in the feed business, um, see, in 2000, I guess, I purchased a small feed mill in Topeka, Indiana called Honeyville Feed. And uh, within the first year, I had uh, Pete Lehman, which a lot of people that listen to this will probably know who he is, um, came to me one day and wondered if we wouldn't get involved in uh, organic fertilizer. That was the first uh, attempt of getting involved organically, as the Honeyville feed was just a little conventional feed mill at the time when I purchased it. So uh, in my mind, that was a no-brainer because uh, I believed in it. That's how I was brought up. I knew it was a sustainable way of farming, so I still, we started in, I think it was 01, in the fertilizer side of uh, organic fertilizer, and then, of course, that uh, kind of brought it to the feed side, and if we want to complete the circle, we felt like we needed to get into the feed side as well, so we uh, rented a facility in Millersburg uh, from 01, or I'm sorry, um, 05 is when we started making organic feed. Uh, I still remember the date, October 5th. Uh, 2005 we made our first batch of organic feed that was ever made in northern Indiana from scratch and uh, we rented that until 2008 uh, grew quite a bit until then probably maybe 60 ton a week roughly 40 to 60 ton at that time and then we purchased uh, Wolkaville grain which is now Wolf Co-op in uh, 2008 and uh, I owned it until 2013 when it became the Wolf Co-op in February of 2013. And April 30th, uh, two months later, or a month and a half later, I guess, two and a half months later, uh, the old original mill here at the Co-op burned to the ground uh, one night, and uh, which was devastating and uh, looked like life was ending just about at the moment but uh, in my mind it was not an option to uh, to quit um, our farmers needed feed and so uh, we proceeded to figure out a way to go on rendered a, a tractor and grinder and we never missed a day of making feed we made feed the very next day uh, we did have some storage out back that we had some grains that we can continue making feed so uh, we made feed with a grinder and tractor for um, from April 30th until I believe it was about the end of July, 1st of August. We got the mixer set up in the new mill in the uh, you know building that we had out back, and uh, yeah, it was kind of like living out a nightmare. But uh, now this is 2017, four years later, and uh, we're doing over a thousand ton a week. And so now uh, looking back. 
I definitely would not choose uh, that journey to get where we're at, but it was a blessing in disguise because we could not do what we're doing today with the old facility. So it's been a, it's in a, it's actually been a blessing. But uh, like I said, I, I reminisce sometimes and think back of those days, and uh, I get uh, chills up my back because it was literally maybe living out a nightmare. I mean, it was it was a lot of challenging times. Now you said the the mill burned down a two and a half months after the after co-op the was formed. Was formed, correct. And what were the volumes you were doing at that time? Roughly, I would say our biggest week was probably sixty ton a week, roughly, maybe a little over sixty to hundred ton, probably. At and that time, you're at a thousand ton a week now. Four years later, part of that has been because of the feed mill burning down. <laughs> you know, essentially yes. that allowed for an updated facility because that original facility was what a... Oh. It was built in the late 1800s. So okay. it was a very old facility. Yeah. It had wooden frame grain legs and it had an old flour mill in it. It had a lot of history in it. It, uh, it did, it had a lot of uh, interesting pieces of equipment in it. it. Had an old cob crusher and... And they, that all burnt? Yeah, that's all history. I do miss some of those pieces because they were kind of unique pieces that were part of the the old mill there, but uh, had two old wooden grain cleaners in, the one we still use right up to the day it burned. Um, but yes, it definitely um, it brought us larger customers because of uh, an updated state-of-the-art system, batching system, computerized. So uh, it definitely has brought us to where we are. I mean, was was the plan to eventually be where you are now? The fire just put that into overdrive. Yeah, I would say so. There, and like I said, there was two and a half months after the the co-op formed. But we had conversation prior to the fire that you know maybe someday we could add a second mill out in the uh, in the other building and and have that more for the poultry slash grinding part of of the feed business and then maybe do calf feeds and that kind of stuff up here and have have two separate mills that was a comment nothing that we necessarily i would say we're really planning on but it was in conversation that you know someday we could maybe do something like that to get more of the poultry bigger business those kind of things but yeah definitely uh definitely kicked it in overdrive when we had the fire and and of course, some of the questions at that point were, well, do we do we rebuild? Is this for sure what we want to do? Do we stay here? Does the community want us here? Do we go somewhere else? Uh, a lot of those type of questions that came up. But uh, the night of the fire, I had a lot of local neighbors come up to me and ask if we're going to rebuild, if we're going to stay here. They need us. They wanted us here. So that felt good. And I told them, well, we're definitely probably not leaving. I don't know if, if we'll for sure rebuild here, of course, at the time, but I figured we would. And of course we did. And uh, yeah, the community is, is happy to have us here. We feel it. And now let's go into a little bit of the source of that growth. When you started in 05 making feed organically, um, th that was mostly for dairy farmers, organic dairy farmers, correct? correct? Mm -hmm. yeah, and at that point, what, do you know how many, well, 05, there probably must have been 30, 40 organic dairy farmers in the area? I don't think there were that many that Maybe. were actually buying feed yet. Okay. Because I remember the first time that we, the first week we made feed, if, if I recall correctly, I was thinking there was only about a half a dozen that started getting feed right away. Okay. Yep. I think. Yeah, and that there would were be more a, soon, soon after that. Sure. But I know Pete Lehman, Willard Yoder were a couple of those. I'm not sure who the others were, but I, I remember those two vividly were of the now, first ones. What year did the pool, the organic dairy pool of farmers start here? That would have been end of 05, early 06. So that would line up right about right, the time yeah. with when you were starting to make feed. And over the years, over the 12 years since then, that number has grown. That number of organic dairy farmers has grown from half a dozen to 130, 150 between the two different companies that pick up milk in this area. But you know, one thing in working a little bit with you guys is that I found interesting is that the dairy business or dairy farmers can't 
really, it's tough for dairy farmers to carry a feed mill. That is very true. Yeah, and and uh, um, since the mill burned down and getting the automated system, it's been the chickens that have really led the led the growth. Can you talk a little bit about not necessarily exactly all the customers, but just the growth of the organic chicken industry in this area? Yeah, when I when I purchased the property here, we had one poultry customer that we worked with, maybe three, four barns, something like that, very minimal. But uh, I would say we were probably, I'm not sure how much of that growth came before the fire, but we had been working with on a number of barns prior to the fire. Um, if I'd have to guess, maybe a dozen or more. Had some talk with uh, other producers about poultry feed. Um, no real commitments as, or contracts. Um, but uh, yeah, then after the fire, it seemed that that kind of definitely um, brought a lot more interest in the poultry side. People liked the facility, liked the updated batching system. Um, I know when we put in the automated batching system, in my mind, which I had never worked with one or yeah, owned one, but uh, it just seemed like overkill at the time. I was like, wow, do we really need this this high? you know, state-of-the-art equipment. And I know the first couple of weeks we uh, we were working with the automated part, I I was ready to go back to pushing carts for a while because of all the uh, glitches and things, but uh, now it's like, wow, the the preciseness of it and the, the uh, efficiency of it is just, it's it, it blows your mind. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I would definitely never go back because it's, nothing gets missed. I mean, what weighs up is what gets billed. Um, the computer doesn't let you make a batch that's not correct. I mean, it it, ha it, it stops you if, if something doesn't weigh up right. I mean, it's, it's pretty unique. It's been pretty uh, interesting to see what it's done for the efficiency of the business. But yes, that being said, that brought a lot more poultry business, and we are now working with probably five different fairly good-sized poultry customers which definitely deserve to be thanked for the success of of Wolf Co-op and, and carrying the business. I mean, the the uh, dairy side of it is it's 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 a good thing, but uh, the dairy do a lot of grazing in the summertime, so the dairy business side of it goes down quite a bit in the summertime. In the winter, it's fairly busy on the dairy side because they're buying protein; they don't have grass. Um, so yeah, we're very, very grateful and thankful for the poultry business to uh, to help carry the mill so that it's here for the dairy side of it. Do you have a ballpark on number of barns that are being worked with? You said a dozen to start and now up to any idea? If I would have to guess, probably between 60 and 70 okay. at least, I yeah. would say. Yeah. Now that would be layer and broiler barns both? That is broiler, layer, and uh, pullets. We do feed a lot of pullet stage too as well, where they put them as chicks, take them up to laying stage, and then they go to layer barns. We do probably, I'm going to guess, around 20 barns of those probably, roughly. Now if, if all this business were to come to you and the old mill were here, well, first of all, do you think that business would have come to you if the old mill was here? And second of all, if they would have come to you, what would you have even told them? I mean, at that point, I think the capacity of that mill might have been, even one of those big customers probably would have just about overloaded the capabilities. Yeah, it probably would have. Um, I'm guessing we could have probably got some of that business, but uh, I would be very doubtful that we would have ever got what we have today um, the knowing what I know now of of the support that we have of the board that that is running the co-op um, they're aggressive minded very much like I am they want to move forward I'm sure if it would have came with the old mill we probably would have pursued something to uh, upgrade and, and have a second mill my guess and kind of divide maybe the poultry and the dairy thing up or something like that where we could be more efficient and run that kind of volume. Uh, I would like to think we would have made the changes that it would have took to get there, um, but definitely don't, it would have, there would have been no way 
that we could do in the old mill what we're doing today, there would not have been enough hours in a day because mm -hmm. of the way it was built. It just wasn't made for that kind of volume. First of all, can you say what you were in sales when you started in 13, uh, or when it became the co-op, and what we were at in 16, 2016? I believe the last year before the co-op started, I think it was 1.5 or 1.6 million, I think, if I remember correctly. Not 100% sure on that anymore, a little vague on that, but uh, last year, as of 2016, I think we were right at 15 million uh, in sales, um, which really does not equate to what we're doing because we tow mill for our largest customer. We just do tow milling, basically, which they bring in their own corn and bean meal. So if you were to equate that to dollars in sales if of us making all that feed, it would be more than double that. Sure. So what is tow milling? Uh, basically, they bring in their ingredients, their big ingredients. They bring in their corn and bean meal and grain bank it here. So they're not actually buying that from us. All they buy from us is your small mineral ingredients, your premixes, uh, small ingredients, which is very minimal, price per ton. So when you figure it, price per ton, we're talking our cost to them maybe, I mean, I'm just throwing a number out here, it's not exact, but let's say 50 to $60 a ton versus 550 to $600 a ton if we were to charge them for corn and bean meal and everything. So if you take that and they're buying probably 700 ton a week, just that customer, six to 700 ton a week. So if you would equate all that, you would be way over double in sales than what the number I just gave you. But because of the tow milling part of it, it brings that number down. So if you really would want to see where we're at from where we came, it would be a lot bigger number than that. But the nice part there is there's, there's risk and reward to that. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot less risk in handling all that inventory on our part. And they're a very, very good customer. Um, got a very good relationship, working relationship with them, and it, you know, we're very happy to do it for them. And it keeps your state-of-the-art mill running. It does wide it open. Definitely, you bet. Keeps now, can, with the equipment that you have here, can you keep growing over the thousand ton a week? Yeah, we're only so you're running, not running at capacity right now. No, we're only running one shift as of right now, um, and we're very open to. Uh, run a second shift if we need to. Um, I'm always looking ahead. Um, growth is what drives me. I like to be busy. Uh, <laughs> sitting around is not my uh -oh. piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm always well, thank looking. Thank you for, for doing this. <laughs> uh, um, but no, that being said, I have pretty much have a plan in place of what we need to do for the next step to revamp things to where we can double our capacity of what we're doing right now. And uh, it's not gonna be a, a huge, huge investment at all. And we build it with that anticipation in place of looking into the future, you know, hey, if we ever max this thing out, let's make it so that we don't have to make a totally start over to revamp this thing so we can up our production. And uh, very minimal costs we can, we'll be able to make some changes and, and double our mm -hmm. production. I want to step back a little bit to when the co-op was formed. Now, you were the sole owner of the mill prior to the co-op. Right. Did you then sell to the co-op, or are you a member of the co-op? I sold to the co-op. You sold to the co-op, mm -hmm. and now you work for the co-op as the general manager. That's correct. Okay. I wasn't sure if you were also a a member owner as well as the general manager i am not at that point the way they had written it up it it made that i couldn't be i think that's changed now but uh at that point it was because of um the way the bylaws were the set way up. yeah the way the bylaws were written and stuff that it technically i couldn't be a member at the at that time which was not really what i anticipated when i first thought of a co-op or that direction at least, but uh, I'm happy with the way it is. I, The reason I was okay with doing something like this is because I sensed what was coming. I, I sensed that the organic industry is exploding, so to speak, and uh, I kind of felt there's probably more to life than going to an early grave to try to keep up with that. 
Uh, <laughs> Might as well get on the wave instead of getting run <laughs> over by it. Huh? Yeah. And it's been a good experience. And probably the, probably the biggest positive thing that I will see in going this direction and like about the co-op is the, uh, I guess, what I'm going to call getting it back to operating the way I think we were meant to operate. It's more a uh, community working together instead of I'll take care of myself and you take care of yourself and you leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. It's kind of the mentality out there these days anymore in society and how farming is done and I just like the way that uh, this organic thing has brought us back to working together, helping each other. I tell you my experiences, you tell me mine, we learn from each other and I think it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I really do. How many members are there in the co-op? I believe there's 80 some now, something like that. Uh, still growing. More people. And you have to be a member of the co-op in order to buy feed here, or can you know the that customer that you do all the grinding for? They wouldn't have to be a member of the co-op in order to have you do that work for them. You have. We have to do a certain amount of business with with members to be a co-op. So definitely some of them would have to be now you don't have to be a member to do business with us but we have to keep track of those numbers to make sure that we are legally a co-op and, and operating under the the uh, amounts that we, we need to be which we are now um, that's not a problem but you don't necessarily have to be a member to do business mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. but it's if you do any kind of volume it's to your best interest to be a member because at the end of the year there's patronage refunds and uh, I'm pretty sure I you're hard put to find somebody that don't mind getting a check at the end of the year. <laughs> now, could I become a member even though you don't deliver anywhere close to where I live? You can't be an actual member if you don't do business with us, but you can invest and be a part of it. But how way. much would I have to buy? Like a couple bags of chicken feed? Yeah, well, no, okay, as far as being a member, yeah, we have a cutoff point of $4,000 of sales okay. a year. Mm -hmm. You have to do at least four thousand dollars in a given year, and that's all. Member. That's all changed in the last yeah year. That's I mean, correct. The, the original bylaws were set up in one direction, and then as this thing has evolved and the business has grown and new opportunities have come up, the bylaws had to change to allow for some of those member or purchasers to become members because the volumes were so high that it was getting close to the point where technically they couldn't be considered a co-op but again like Lamar said it was to the to the benefit of those people or those purchasers to become members because now they're eligible for patronage refund so it's been a learning experience which is actually the next question I wanted to ask was you know that 1.5 million to 15 million dollars in sales it sounds great and wonderful and and that's all done in four years, but let's go into some of the struggles over those four years of, of that amount of growth. I mean, I, I've, I've watched some of this happen, and it's been very interesting, and <laughs> to say the least, it, it can be stressful at times, but I just wanted you, in your own words, to kind of point out some of the struggles of that, all that growth. Well, yeah, I definitely... Uh I'll just put it this way, it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> uh, it it brought a lot of challenges, definitely growing that fast. I mean, we of course, we came out of a fire building this new mill, so we had to make decisions fast and to uh, design a mill and overnight and, and trying to make the right decisions and doing it right, why, that was a big challenge. Um, and then, of course, by the time we got it going, a year later, another feed mill, organic feed mill, burnt and we committed to take their business until they get rebuilt and so that brought us 350 ton overnight uh, wow. which we were not prepared for whatsoever but it was our commitment to help uh, we felt like we needed to and so we we worked not quite day and night but uh, we worked some pretty crazy hours uh, to to make that happen until we could make a few changes uh, we built again we built the mill um, with the future in mind so we can make some changes but we build it so we could go on from where we were at at the moment and then with plans of adding some of the things that we did right away then basically a year later 
um, that we had kind of planned to grow into as we can because funds, of course, it all takes money to pay for all that. And one of those things was uh, we just had one grain leg to uh, unload trucks as well as unload the mixer. So all of a sudden, 350 tons more feed in one day, you've got so much more volume coming in and so much more feed going out, and so you had to stop unloading it or stop batching feed, just unload an incoming truck, and so it was pretty crazy there for a while, so we quick put up grain leg to unload the batcher so that we could unload trucks and unload the batcher at the same time. That's one example of some of those things that uh, took a lot of time that made a huge difference once we could get that in place. Something we were planning on doing, but at the moment we didn't need to because we weren't that busy, but overnight we had to, and so we did. Um, other things that we, uh, some ingredients we used to get in bags that we couldn't, we about now made sense to get in in bulk. Well, we didn't have bin storage for it yet, so we, we would get it in in bulk, run it in the bins, and tote it out in big tote bags after hours oftentimes because we were too busy during the day. Um, yeah, those are just a couple of the uh, crazy things that we did, I guess, just to, to keep up. But, uh, and I know some people think, we probably were a little crazy of how we did some things, but in my mind, quitting was not part of my vocabulary or giving up. And I knew what we just went through in the fire, and so I was like, you know what? I'm going to do what it takes because I know what they're going through. And we did, were just did glad that, we could help. Did that customer that you helped out with the 350 ton, do you still do business with them, or did they pull all their business out once they No, that they was about exactly a year later. They got their mill rebuilt and, and pulled that all out again. And that was another concern that we had when that happened. Um, we were like, okay, you know, we, may, we revamped. We spent quite a bit of money to make that we could help them out right up front there. And so a year later when they – and we picked up some business over that time that year, not just a huge amount, but we did some – but then when they pulled out, we were like, wow, are we going to be able to keep going now with that much less production, with the revamping we did and everything? But uh, we were like, well, you know, hey, we'll just make the best of it. We think it'll work. And I think it was a year later we were doing more business without them than we were doing with them at the time. Uh, just another big growth spurt came right after that. And uh, That might be what they call karma. <laughs> you help somebody out and it just came back to... <laughs> That's what it about seemed like, but, you know, then, of course, as we could, we added bins here and there, and and uh, I just made the comment to the board last week, that, uh, or two weeks ago, we were at a board meeting, that I, for the first time in four years, feel like we have caught up with where we're at in production. I feel like things are all in place like they need to be. It's kind of a good feeling. Well, and that was one of the things when... When the, you know, as this growth was all happening, and there's still going to be things that come up like this, oh, yeah. but but it was a plan would be we we talk about future plans. Okay, we need to get this piece of equipment or this bin or whatever it may be, and then next month Lamar would come in and say we need that now. I mean, that's just the kind of growth that was happening because those capabilities were needed they right. had to be there and you know we're also dealing with customers that that want you know we're trying to make them happy too correct uh, and that's the it's that delicate balance of spending money to keep people happy but not spending too much that it puts us in a financial burden and so far i think it's been fairly well balanced but it's been a tightrope walk, that's for it sure. It has been, very <laughs> so, much so. Brian, what is your role? Because you sit in on the board meetings, right? That's what right. is your role? Well, I guess I started off as a, just a, a representative of Organic Valley, and it's kind of grown into more of a – well, originally Organic Valley was, you know, had eyes on this mill being the supplier of the dairy uh, folks in the area. Um, and like we talked about earlier, the dairy producer just couldn't keep enough production through, especially the new mill, with mm -hmm. the amount of money that was invested in the new mill. The volumes that would go out to the dairy producers was not enough to keep it going, that's for sure. So that's where all a lot of these changes have come. And so, I mean, we still produce feed for the dairy producers, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess I've just become more of a board advisor um, and sit in and watched all this growth, and it's been pretty fascinating. And 
a learning experience, that's for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Because my first would have been five and a half years ago, I think. Uh, I was out for the regional meeting that Organic Valley puts on at Pete Layman's, and that was right when they were trying to get things going. Dan Moskaller was still oh, yeah. involved, and I remember walking out of that being like, what are they biting off here? <laughs> Little did we know what we were biting yeah. off yeah. or what was coming. Yeah. But we see that uh, in central Ohio where I live. There's a couple of mills that do some organic but we have Kambach Feeds, who brings in basically all the poultry uh, stuff to the organic barns, except a couple of the small organic valley barns are, are fed by a local feed mill. But the, low, the small feed mills cannot compete with the efficiencies of, of the big automated systems. Mm -hmm. So it's And the dairy producers, like you said, Brian, just don't buy enough feed uh, to get a mill running, you know, keep right. it running. So... I'm I'm hoping the chicken business expands in my region because it would really be a benefit to the smaller mills in there. Well, let's talk about where we're sitting right now. We're sitting in a brand new office building, uh, part of the growth that's happened here. Um, Wolf used to be headquartered in right across the driveway, a little, a little. I don't know what the square foot is, but it's pretty tiny. Not very big. <laughs> and uh, um, in an old breezy drafty office yeah. building yep and we're actually sitting on the site of the original mill correct? that's correct yeah and how long how long ago did you move into the the new office building here hmm, probably about four weeks ago now okay. roughly yeah and it's it's big uh it's got enough space it's got a showroom uh it's even got organic food in that I, I, that's pretty neat i think that's something that uh, hopefully the local community will now be able to have access because that's definitely been something too I mean uh, not only was it access to organic feed but now organic food and Wolf is doing both now that's correct yeah it was uh, well we, we needed a new office uh, we were getting we all grew the other one and so we were trying to decide how big do we go, what do we, we wanted a bigger showroom so we can have handle more products and at first we weren't really thinking food and then I'm not sure who, I'm thinking I brought it up, I'm not sure but it don't really matter. Anyway, the thought came up of, well why don't we make it a little bigger and have a big showroom and actually bring in the grocery side of, of the organic world and I guess in my mind complete the circle. Uh, make that it can be a one-stop shop for the organic people where they can come get their organic weed spray and grab their organic milk and whatever they need get it all in one place and so that's kind of where that uh, uh, was born from I guess um, so yeah it uh, it's it's we are very much enjoying the new office um, it's been very readily uh, accepted in the community. People are very excited about it. Uh, they can shop locally for their uh, healthy foods. I have been actually amazed how much, I didn't know how much we really have right around us here. Um, I knew there's Kenderville people and, and Gold and those kind of areas that, that think that way, but I didn't realize how much are right here in town. And we've had quite a few people come in here and comment and they say, I live right over here on, Orange Street or whatever, you know, and they're right here in town and they're excited about these healthy foods. So it's, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we definitely need some growth on the uh, retail side to make that pay for itself yet. But uh, there's more right here than I realize, and that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest hurdle is going to be just getting the word out there, right. people to know that it's here. Because right now it's just, I mean, it's just been a feed mill. Right. And, you know, a lot of people that aren't farmers don't pay much attention to the feed mill. They just know that trucks leave and trucks come. And, uh, um, yeah, getting the word out there is probably going to be one of the biggest hurdles. Um, and then let's talk about the other project that's happening out behind the old office building, um, putting up solar panels to run the entire mill, correct? That's right. Yep, we are uh, in the process. They're building it right now, um, putting up a big field of solar panels where it will generate enough power to run the, the whole mill. 
Uh, it's going to be 16 arrays, which is covers about a half acre out there. Um, and again, another one of those things where at first when the thought came up, I was like, is that really something we need? Um, but it does very much go along with, I guess, who we are, a go green company, so to speak. And uh, to have uh, a solar system that uh, we can generate our own power, I think, is a great thing. And uh, it's uh, about a seven-year payback. And after that, you make your own power, and you don't need to buy it. So I think it's a good thing. Do you, by any chance, carry organic milk replacer? I don't as of right now. I just found out it's available. I actually clipped the ad out of the organic trader. I'm like, what? Because, you know, the cost-wise, it's going to be the same as a dairy guy feeding raw milk. Mm -hmm. But for somebody like me who doesn't have cows... right. So I saw it, and I'm like, ooh, I wonder if Lamar has that. I don't. We, I talked to a gentleman that carries it, that I can get it in. Um, I've been kind of telling people about it. I figured if we have requests, I'll get it in. But as of right now, I have not had a request for it yet because I didn't really expect the actual farmers to uh, be buying it. I don't think mm -hmm. it's going to be a, a huge mover, but uh, I can see potential for, like you said, somebody that wants to raise a couple calves organically or something like that would well, definitely be a good fit. It's really the first option in the U.S. of being able to raise organic calves on milk if you don't have access to a cow. Right. So mm -hmm. when I saw it, I was kind of excited because I thought, well, I might do that instead of raising steers. <laughs> there you go. Because I never had the option. I, w I tried the nurse cow thing, and that didn't work out so well. <laughs> organic molasses, dry molasses is another thing that just came out. I don't know if you're oh, aware really? of that, but didn't we do know. carry that. That's a good thing if you got farmers that are grinding at home with their own grinder. It's just very, very hard and uh, not satisfactory to be dumping liquid molasses in the top of the mixer. Uh, gums up your mixer, makes a mess. A lot of people will just end up not even adding molasses, so that's an option out there for. That's the old run it really, really slow yeah. and pour it in really, really slow. And While the dust is flying up in your eyes. Yep, I used to do that <laughs> when I made caffeine as a kid growing up. Yeah, but we, if if you ran it slow enough and you poured it in slow enough, you could keep it from splashing to the outside yeah. of the mixer, but not Trust ideal. Trust me, we did a lot of that from April 30th, 2013 to July. I bet. <laughs> we did our share. Well, Mike, can you think of any other questions? Not really. I do want a facility tour while I'm here because this is from... You know, not being involved at all, but watching from the outside, talking with Dan when the thought first came up, to see where it is today is just nothing short of wonderful. And to see how uh, it's turned into a community thing, and now with the, the retail store and stuff, I think that is just really, really cool. Mm -hmm. I would love to see something like that in my region. So another thing I like the other thing I didn't mention about the retail side of it that it, it feels good to me is we have meat and dairy products in the store that we are literally feeding the animals they come from. And that's exciting. Mm -hmm. I just like to see that. Mm -hmm. That to me feels very community oriented as well. Mm -hmm. Making that circle complete, I guess, like mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier. And that actually is one other question that I just thought of is that um you're delivering feed in mostly the local area, but you're delivering into Michigan and down to Indianapolis. How far would you go? Uh, how far? What radius? Or not? Don't um, really have a limit. Uh, yeah, we go west of Indianapolis. That's the furthest south we go. Um, I think that's about a four and a half hour drive. It's over towards the Illinois line, just straight west of Indy. And we go up to, we just went up to Coppersville, Michigan, I think it's called today. Uh, I think that's about as far north as we go. We have been up to the Thumb and over into Leroy, Michigan some. Uh, not, a, not a steady thing, which kind of random things if they run out of product or something. Um, into the edge of Ohio, uh, Rockford, or, uh, yeah, Rockford, just west of Fort Wayne, or east of Fort Wayne into Ohio. Uh, that would be Wayne County area? Uh, Wayne County is oh, that's further so west. Cool. Yeah. Rockford is west of Indy. Can't think of the name of the town. We've been into Ohio a little bit, but not a lot. Kind of the same way, just here and there, randomly. 
But as far as regular customers, Indy and then up into uh, Michigan is the is the furthest west. We don't go very far. Um, but yeah, by far majority, I would say 85 percent of what we do is probably within a 50 mile radius. But that need roughly. is coming from this type of mill focused only on organic is not very widespread right now. It's there's options here and there like we were talking earlier with mills that are running conventional that are also doing a small amount of organic on the side but the volumes that are going through this facility are significantly more than and this setup this type of setup is not many other places currently right and it's i mean yeah you about and we're very fortunate uh, like we talked about earlier we're very fortunate to have the poultry business right here so thickly populated like we do because that is definitely the bread and butter of of this feed mill and and to to start up a feed mill like this i mean it's it would be tough without something like this in the area to uh, have the volume you need to to keep it floating now you're 100 percent organic on the feed side we are definitely wow because well we now have one in ohio that's but it's just a division of another feed mill Mm -hmm. where that division that facility is only organic but there's nothing like that in ohio Mm -hmm. yeah that's all we do here I think it's like we talked earlier. It's that it's that the poultry business is here, and I think it could work with a hog business or something it like could, that yeah. too. But with just having to rely on dairy, organic dairy, the you know, organic dairy. Um, I think most of the organic dairy folks, and it, uh, profitability-wise, it makes sense for them to grow as much of their own feed as possible. But that also makes it very tough for a feed mill to <laughs> float itself on. Uh, uneven amounts of feed you know just coming through as they need it right. not necessarily every year or every month or every every week even um, so yeah that that I think the biggest lesson that I've taken out of this one of the biggest lesson I've taken out of this is that you know a feed mill to make it work can't be on the backs of the dairy farmer it's got to be on the backs of some some something else it's got to be right. diverse but i think the the dairy guys really benefit from Absolutely. the poultry no, they do because right? it's because of the poultry that they've got the service available to them that they have plus they've got the poultry manure mm-hmm. to go that, along and there's with another it. part of that that is huge and that is the cost of their feed yep the volume that we can buy because of our poultry farms probably i would say on an average at least a hundred dollars a ton cheaper for our dairy farmers just because of the volume that we're buying in at least it might even be more than that Mm -hmm. so it's and i i've tried to drive that home in our annual meetings that you know i I've, i've heard comments well do we really need all these poultry farmers you know I'm like, yes, you do. Mm-hmm. They're the ones that are paving the way for you guys. You better thank them because it, it's not only making that they have a source, it's making a, a lot more sustainable price source, and it keeps it more sustainable. I mean, we're, we're, I'm seeing a more balanced, sustainable prices in the last year than I've ever seen yet where mm-hmm. it stays a little more steady instead of these spikes way high and those kind of things mm-hmm. well that that actually brings up another thing i meant to ask too is that sourcing um you know you're getting as much locally as possible what volume or what percent of the volume that would come through here that you purchase would be um rel- you can define local however but within the general region here Actually, this year has been phenomenal. We have been buying a lot of grain out of Michigan. I have yet to buy my to myself purchase a load of uh, imported grain this year. Uh, we buy some imported bean meal, but as far as corn, which is I feel the more main critical part, uh, I have bought been able to buy all domestic. It's getting very tight right now, but we're about a month and a half away from harvest. Um, so I might have to buy some to, to hold us over, but it's been, yeah, we've got connected with a lot of farmers out of Michigan up to the thumb up in there. 
Um, I'm going to call the local a little bit further out on, on the grain side, but oh, I pulled a load from Illinois, Iowa, um, some of those areas. But uh, by far, majority of the grain or the corn that came in here this year has probably been within 300 miles at least or less. And a lot of it really local. I mean, we, we've got more and more guys raising it around here, which is very exciting. Uh, I got a new guy coming on this year that's got a couple hundred acres that's never raised before. Uh, so there's more and more guys doing it, and that's very exciting. That's what we want. Well, I think that's exciting on the farmer side as well because now these guys have a great place to sell their grain so they don't have to worry about transitioning their land to organics and then really not finding a market close for their now, will you also buy it out of the field and dry it here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have a dryer here. We do a lot of drying. We probably dried, I don't know, over 200,000 bushels last year, I would say. And that's another thing we are putting up yet before. They're fact, supposed to start this week, uh, getting concrete poured for another big grain bin. We're putting up a 125,000 bushel grain bin yet before harvest because, well, our missions, I take our mission statement seriously. Uh, our mission is to provide sustainable feed for our farmers as well as a source for farmers to sell grain. And last year, we, within three weeks after harvest, we were full, didn't have room, we had to shut people off, and that's just bad business. Uh, I don't want to be there this year, so we're adding another one this year and probably another one the same size next year probably to make that we got the storage for because you know we we go out and we recruit these guys and we want them to raise organic grain and then they want to bring it here and we don't have room that's that ain't a, that picture don't quite jive mm -hmm. so we're trying to stay ahead of that side of it as well to make that we have storage and it's also the best time of year for you to be buying grain it is absolutely uh, because especially the guys that don't have drying capabilities or storing facilities they need to move it out of the field that's right so you can get it a little bit cheaper at that time than you can say you need a load right now. Right. Yeah, usually that's, most years that's the best time to buy it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And those new bins also give the capability to, you mentioned buying some imported grain. Uh, imported grain has kind of been a controversial, controversial issue uh, over the last couple of months. Um, the new bins allow the local or the domestic grain to go in, put, allow you the option to keep those separate if need be. Uh, not to say that all the imported grain is not organic, but that's been uh, a controversial issue. Can you talk a little bit about what you've done to ensure that the imported grain is or is what it says it is? Yeah, we... Uh and I'll be honest, that goes goes against my grain very much to buy imported grain. Not that I don't like them or that I don't believe that there's organic grain out there, but uh, this community thing and working as a community has, has really uh, taken on a new meaning to me. Uh, being in business now for 17 years, I have... I see the, the importance of um, supporting local businesses when I go shop because anywhere I spend money in my local community, that's keeping our money in the community. So why do I want to send my money overseas when that's not helping build the community here? So that's the biggest thing I struggle with. Um, but then, of course, yeah, there's been controversial. I know there's yeah been quite a bit of uh, talk about the uh, imported grains and cheating and those kind of things going on, and which you're going to have that in any industry. There's always someone that wants to cheat the system. but. Uh, uh, we do, uh, we test for toxins here. Everything that we buy gets tested for toxins, and we also do random testing on GMOs. Uh, we're planning on doing a more steady diet of, of GMO testing in the future. Um, but I have been uh, pretty uh, intense on making sure that the paper trail is real and true. If I buy import back to a good source, there are, there are countries that I won't buy from just because of uh, what uh, what we've heard and seen out there uh, I don't I'm not going to take any chances um, so yeah we we do everything in our power to make sure that what we bring in here is is truly organic and a good product and now you do GMO testing um, 
because well i mean there's going to be the question obviously of organic is always non-gmo well that is technically true but because of all the gmo crops being grown not all that pollen can't be can't be controlled you can't keep you know one field of organic corn and one field of conventional corn in two separate boxes um, and so there is some drift that comes in so there's an allowance of the certain amount of and it's up to five percent yeah five percent right now it's five percent we're probably going to lower our standards to three just because i feel if we're organic then we should have tight standards um even on the gmo side i know there's there's drift in pollen and and those things happen but i think if we're uh, i'm looking at it from my side and then also converting that to the farmer's side if i'm a true organic farmer I'm also going to do what I can to make that I plant at a different time so that it doesn't pollinate at the same time my neighbor's conventional field does. I think it's a two-way street. Um, if the farmer wants that's selling the corn wants a quality product to sell, um, we both need to do our part. I need to test and make sure it's right, but he also needs to pay attention when he plants and what his neighbor's doing so that he can make that healthy crop that we can get it in here and in the terms that we need to yeah and so far that that five percent allowance has kind of been uh i don't know it's been arbitrary essentially uh just because they didn't know what they didn't know what kind of volume or they didn't know organic was such a small part and it's so tough to segregate out fields but like you said as we're learning more and more we're getting better and better at um, improving that quality and i can see on the organic side those standards getting lowered as well especially as the non-gmo standards improve right well can you think of anything else samar i don't think i can right now uh, hopefully this will be of help to someone that's my goal. Mm -hmm. Well, we really appreciate you sitting down with us, and I know you don't like to sit down, but this was a good 50 minutes of sitting down with us, so we really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thanks, Lamar. You bet.